Hello, my name is Lawrence Nora. I'm a travel photographer and blogger, and I run two websites, Finding Universe and Independent Travel Cats. I also run an online photography course at travelphotographycourse.com. I've been taking photos for a long time. Here's a photo of me holding on to my first camera. I have uh, advanced a little bit since then. Today I'm proud to be a Vanguard ambassador. I've worked on projects with Sony and Panasonic, and I've had my work featured in publications around the world, including the National Geographic website, BBC, and CNN. This image here is a rock arch in Santa Cruz, California, which featured on the National Geographic homepage. And this image is a shot of a Scottish Abbey in the Scottish borders, uh, which featured on the BBC news site. But that's enough about me. Today we're going to be talking about how to improve your travel photography. Now I believe there's three areas you need to master as a photographer. These are how and why to adjust your camera settings to achieve the desired effect. So that might be things like changing the shutter speed, the ISO, the aperture, focus, those different camera settings, so the technical side of photography. I think you need to understand composition, which is the second side. So how to compose a great photo, where to place your subject, what makes for a good photo. And then finally, how to edit a photo. So today I don't have time to talk about all of those things, but there are a lot of great talks as part of this virtual presentation, so they'll cover a lot more of those topics. But today I'm going to be focusing on composition. So why composition? Well, composition uh, applies to all types of camera. So smartphones, DSLRs, compact cameras. You can use photography composition tips to improve your photography, whatever your type of camera. They're also quite easy to apply. So it's quite easy to learn some rules of composition and quickly improve your photos. Specifically today, I'm going to be talking about subject, separation, foreground, background, and leading lines. These are all four compositional techniques that I believe are important for travel photography. Let's start with this. This is an image of uh, Neist Point on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. And I'm going to use it to talk about subject. For me, subject is the most important thing to think about when you're taking a photo. The question you have to ask yourself is, what is the photo of? And what do you want your viewer to be looking at when they first see that photo? So this is a shot of a lighthouse on the Isle of Skye. It's called Neist Point. And the subject in this shot was the lighthouse. As you can see, it's a small white lighthouse just at the end of the cliff. And the white of the lighthouse draws the viewer's eye to it as the, the cliff edge. So the cliff edge draws your eye along there. And then once you've locked onto the lighthouse, you can explore the rest of the shot. You've got the stormy cl clouds in the sky. You have the sea, which is quite turbulent. There's quite an exciting story going on here. And I did actually get quite wet about 15 minutes after taking this shot. So don't think, though, uh, when you're talking about subject, that you can only have one subject in your shot. You can have multiple subjects. So for example, this shot is of a cottage in Glencoe, also in Scotland. I was lucky enough to live in Scotland for a number of years, so I have a lot of photos from Scotland. So when you're looking at this photo, I would say that even though the cottage is quite far to the left, it draws your eye in. It's that white color which you, you see the cottage straight away, but then you can explore the rest of the shot. I'd say the river in the foreground here is a nice element, the mountains and the sunset. They all work together to create quite a pleasing image, but there's that main subject and then you can explore the rest of the image. Now let's look at a photo which I would say is an example of a shot which doesn't have a clear subject. So this is actually Utah Beach, which is one of the D-Day landing beaches in Normandy. So quite famous from World War II. So it's a very interesting location and there's an interesting story, but this is a very boring photo. So if you were looking at this as a viewer, you would just see a boring picture of a beach and you would move on. You don't have any context. When I was visiting this beach, I sort of thought, well, this is a very interesting location and I want to take a photo of it, but I didn't capture a good photo. And so somebody looking at this without the context isn't going to be interested to find out more about this photo. If you compare this to this photo, so this is Omaha Beach. So this is another of the D-Day landing beaches, but this one has a large memorial on it. And so using the memorial as the focal subject, it means the viewer is going to be looking at this, they're going to be a little bit interested, and they might want to find out more about this image. So they will probably uh, read the caption um, or read you know, the description I've put in there, and they're going to be wanting to find out more about this location. We are competing online and in print with a lot of different images. So for your images to stand out, you have to make it really easy for your, sub for your viewer to want to engage with that image. So we're just going to look at a couple more images here. 
um, with some very clear subjects. This is the Duomo in Florence, in Italy, and that's obviously the subject of the image. It's very clear. There's nothing else that's distracting. And then this shot of a puffin in flight in Iceland. Again, a subject doesn't have to be very large or it doesn't have to be very small. There's no sort of rule there. The main thing is it's going to draw your viewer in. It's going to be the first thing they really want to look at and is the main, the main focus element of your image. So in summary, uh, the subject needs to be very obvious, should be something the viewer will look at first. And if there isn't a subject in your shot that's clear to the viewer, they're probably just going to disengage and move on to whatever else they're doing. So the second thing I want to talk about today is the concept of foreground and background. So uh, this could also be talked about as depth in your image. So uh, I've got an example shot up on the screen here, which is of an iceberg. The world around us is three dimensional. And when you're taking photos, you're obviously standing in the location and you have the benefit of uh, perspective and depth and you can see the scale. But when you look at a photo, either in print or on a screen, it's a two dimensional representation of that image. The screen here is flat, as you can see. So you don't get the benefit of being able to see the, the, two dim the three dimensions um, that are there. So you need to give your viewers clues as to the depth and scale of the image. So this shot, for example, the pebbles on the beach and the icebergs, they give you a, an impression of, of the sort of the size of the image. And then you can start to explore the rest of the shot with your eyes. You can see the, the sun set in the background, the moody clouds. You can see the waves in the sea. And you get a feeling of the depth of the shot. So this is actually Diamond Beach in Iceland. Uh, it's famous because you get these little icebergs that wash up onto the beach. And they're given the name diamonds. Although if I found a diamond this big, I would probably not be standing here talking to you about photography today. Now, let's look at our next image. So I have two images taken from the same location. And then this is Scotland again. This is Glencoe again. And it's quite an edited shot. I just wanted to use it as an example. Uh, it's a long exposure shot of this mountain with the lock in the foreground. And I would say this image is actually quite flat. So whilst you get this nice mountain in the background, it's very hard to get a sense of the scale. How far away is the mountain from the viewer? Um, what are you really looking at? Whereas if you compare it with the next image, which is taken from a very similar location. I've used this rock in the foreground. So when you look at this shot, the rock sort of anchors your eye, gives you a, a first point, and then you get a feeling for the depth of the image. And you can see how the valley goes away from you. You get an idea of how far away the mountain is. So there's a few different elements in this shot which are giving you that sense of foreground, the lock in the midground, and then the valley in the background. So depth, it's really important to give your viewer that sense of perspective. Another example here, this is a uh, Hengi Foss waterfall in Iceland. And so it's a very tall waterfall, but it's hard to get that sense of scale. How big are the boulders in the river? How big is the waterfall? How big are the cliff face? You can't really tell that. So what I did with this shot is I just put myself in it. So that's me standing on the left there in the blue jacket. And using yourself as a, an element in the image can be really effective because our brains recognize certain things like people, cars, uh, structures like buildings, uh, wildlife, animals, uh, trees. And once you can see an, a recognizable element and your brain thinks, OK, that's a person, a person is roughly this big, um, then it will be able to figure out how big the rest of the uh, scene is. So a person is a good element. Another example here, this is um, Havasu Falls in Arizona, which is a beautiful waterfall in, uh, in Arizona. And I just use these little uh, rocks in the foreground, these little um, little set of stones. So they give the foreground element. They provide the depth. They're sort of a, a first subject that your eye looks onto. And then you can look around the rest of the shot. So in summary, with depth and scale, you have a lot of options for adding depth to an image. I don't feel that you have to do this with every image. You know, With all of these uh, guidelines that I'm providing today, they, you can use them or you don't have to use them. So don't feel that you have to provide depth into all your shots. The, image I talked about before with the Florence Duomo, for example. I didn't have foreground, midground, and background elements that I was thinking about. The Duomo was strong enough to provide that against the buildings in the, in the shot. Just think about what will work for your shot. And don't force elements into a shot either. If you're taking a photo of a landscape and you don't want to have people in it, don't think, oh, I've got to shove a person in here to get that sort of sense of depth. So do what works for your image. And then don't be afraid to position yourself and your camera relative to the scene. I often see people, they'll, you know, they'll arrive at a location, they'll just take the photo and then they'll leave. And they won't reposition themselves. They won't, um, you know, don't be afraid to go up and down to change your angle relative to the shot. Move your subject around. If you have maybe a person, maybe they can move a bit to the left or a bit to the right. So just move elements around to get the shot that you want. 
So the third thing I want to talk about today is separation. So separation is the idea that you don't overlap different elements of your shot. So your foreground elements and your background elements, you're trying not to get your key subjects overlapping each other. So with this example here, which is a black sand beach in Iceland, and this is my wife uh, standing on the beach in front of these two sea stacks. So I wanted to give this impression of like a stormy day, uh, walking on the beach. I wanted to capture these uh, quite famous sea stacks. Um, I wanted some foreground interest, which was uh, my wife, who's amazing at providing foreground interest, as you'll see in some of my other photos. Um, and so, but I positioned her between the sea stacks purposefully. It wasn't on, you know, by mistake. Um, I used the sea stacks to frame her. That's another compositional technique where you can use elements to, to frame a subject. But I didn't want to place her in front of the sea stacks. I mean, that seems very obvious. You, you don't want to obscure you know, one of your elements with another one of your elements. But it's something you have to be conscious about because she might have just been standing a couple of feet to the left and I would have got the photo and not really thought about it. And then after the fact, I would have been like, oh, she's, she's right in the way of that shot. So think about what your viewer is looking at. And also think back to that sort of three-dimensional versus two-dimensional thing I was talking about before. As if you were here in real life and you were looking at this image, if she was standing in front of the sea stack, you could just move to the left or the right and get the, the view you wanted. But when you're looking at an image that someone has provided you, you can't do that. You can't you know, look to the left or to the right. You're, you're pre presented with this two-dimensional image. So it's always about trying to help your viewer and make sure you don't frustrate them with what's on the, uh, what's on the screen or on print in front of them. So just to look at another image here, this is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So this is a classic uh, sort of vacation selfie, I guess. Uh, I took this one on one of my Vanguard tripods, um, which is how I normally take my selfies because I find I get better results that way. Um, so there's two sort of subjects of this shot. There's my wife and I having a romantic moment, and there's the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, two main subjects, but they're not overlapping. They're separate, they're distinct. Um, my wife and I are providing that sort of foreground depth uh, perspective, and the Eiffel Tower in the background is providing the sort of the background and it's, you can see the scale, um, but they're not overlapping, they're not getting in the way of each other. It's, I would say this is a classic, uh, classic vacation photo. Uh, the next image, uh, this is the Blue Mosque in Istanbul in Turkey, in uh, Istanbul specifically, and in the front here we have a number of yellow tulips, and Turkey is famous for the tulips that come out in springtime, and I wanted to include those in the shot because the, the yellow of the tulips worked well against the blue of the sky, and it also was a, allowed me to sort of mask some of the, the mid-ground elements between the tulips and the mosque. There's just, you know, there's some roads and there's some benches. There's nothing particularly uh, interesting to the viewer. So I didn't want to obscure the mosque in the, in the flowers because I thought they would, you know, you don't want to lose it. But I didn't want to, um, I wanted them in the shot. So it was just a question of positioning myself so that I could get all the elements that I wanted in the shot without them sort of mushing into each other and, and not having that sense of separation that I was looking for. So you can see the shot is framed there by the, by the palm tree, which again is slightly overlapping part of the mosque, but not in a way that's too distracting to the viewer. So I think I achieved separation fairly well in this shot um, while still getting the effect I was looking for. So in summary, separation, uh, just try to keep your subjects separate from each other. If you have empty areas of a shot, like in the black sand beach photo I shared before, you have the sky, uh, you know, you can use that. It's an empty space. You might as well put somebody into it. If you're taking a shot of uh, people against the background, if you have um, trees or something in one part of the shot, but you have empty sky in the other part of the shot, try and position your people so they're not getting lost into the trees. Background foliage, you can very easily lose people uh, in that. They blend into it. Whereas if you have a nice empty section of sky, just put your people against that. So the last topic I want to talk about is the idea of leading lines. And leading lines are a great way to lead your viewer into a shot. So I've got this shot up here of a church in Iceland. And you can see that there's this very colorful road at the bottom of the shot, uh, which leads the viewer to the church, which is the main subject. So the, the little path, the little colorful path is the leading line. And that's the first thing you do when you look at this shot, you'll look at the leading line, you'll look at that colorful road, and you'll want to follow it with your eyes. Quite a natural thing to do. We like to follow roads or lines. And so you follow it to the church, which is the sort of the mid-ground, it's the main subject. And then you have the background of the mountain and you're, you've got the houses around which kind of frame it. But you have this very clear leading line. So a leading line can be um, anything really that's just going to draw the viewer's attention and make them follow, a, follow the path. So you, have a, you can have roads, you can have power lines, you can use rivers, uh, cliff edges like the shot of the uh, lighthouse I shared earlier. 
Um, if you're taking photos at night, uh, you can do a long exposure and you can get the car headlights. Um, that, that works as a leading line. Um, and the next shot here, this is uh, Glencoe again in Scotland. And so we have the mountains in the background, which are sort of the main subject that I wanted to share. But I use this road in the foreground because it, it draws your uh, eye as you're looking at this shot. You'll look at the road and you'll want to follow it to see where it goes and you follow it to the mountains in the background. If I didn't have this road in the shot, if you sort of imagine this image without the road, it would just be this expanse of brown and it wouldn't have any depth either. So it would have no interest in the foreground. There would just be this brown and then the mountains. So you wouldn't really get a sense of depth. Um, you, I think you would lose the story. So the, the road is a... Um, it's a very useful tool to draw people into your, into your, view, into your image. Uh, this shot here is Dunrobin Castle in Scotland again. And so in this case, I've used the staircase as the leading line. You, your eyes will lock onto the staircase, follow it up to the top, and then you have the castle, which is the main subject. I also have my wife on the staircase. Um, she's providing a sort of human element, the idea of scale, um, and also a nice splash of red color. Um, and it sort of gives the viewer the impression that they can visit, they can go and take a look at this castle. Um, and, you know, the leading line there, obviously, the staircase. And uh, our last image, I think, on leading lines is this shot, also in Scotland. This was taken at sunrise um, in May, so it was about 4 a.m. And you've got the road here leading the viewer's eye to the mountains in the background. A road is, a, is such a great, I think, a road, just to talk about roads a little bit. As a travel photographer, I find roads to be a really great subject because they give you that impression, that idea of being on the road, um, that idea of a bit of freedom. Um, they really they can take a viewer somewhere and give them an idea. And so as well as being a great leading line, they're also an interesting subject. So leading lines, in summary, uh, they're a great way to help a viewer find the subject in your image. Uh, you can link different subjects together and they can give an image depth. So leading lines are quite a powerful tool for composition. So I'm going to put it all together in this last image. So I've talked about four things today, and I think this image kind of has all four of those in it. So the first thing, we've got a clear subject, which is the tree in the foreground. Uh, this is a shot of a lone pine tree in uh, Scotland. The lock in the background is Loch Marah. And the tree is the main subject, but the tree is not, it, it's separate, I would say, from the rest of the shot. It's not overlapping any of the other elements in a way that is distracting to the viewer. So once you've seen the tree, your eyes might drift over to the road, which works as a leading line and drives you to the back. So you also have that sort of foreground and background. You get the scale provided by the tree, but also by the road. And then you have uh, the background elements of the, of the mountain and the lock. So I just want to conclude. Uh, photography is art. So everything I've talked about today, and whenever you read about compositional rules, um, everything is just a guideline. It's not fixed in stone. It's not something you, know, you have to do. Um, if you apply what I've talked about today to your photos, you will probably see an improvement. I would say you would see an improvement in your photos. Um, but if you decide to, if you use them and then you decide, you know, oh, I, I don't want to use leading lines in the short or I don't want to use, you know, the rule of thirds or whatever other compositional rules that you've learned, it doesn't mean your photos are going to be terrible. It just, uh, these are just guidelines that can help you shortcut to getting better photos. But as you develop, you might find that your best photos are the ones which follow none of the rules, and that's absolutely fine. I was only able to cover a small part of photography today, you know, only covering four compositional rules. So I just wanted to say that I do have a travel photography course at travelphotographycourse.com, where I cover a lot more about photography, the technical aspects of photography, um, ISO, aperture, shutter speed, all of that things, how to choose a camera, um, how to compose a photo. So these tips and then lots more tips, how to edit a photo, and then a lot more advanced things like astrophotography, HDR photography, how to make a living as a photographer, basically everything you can think about. And you also get feedback from me. So that's at travelphotographycourse.com. If you have any questions, having uh, watched this and you want to ask me anything about photography, feel free to drop me an email. My email is lawrence at travelphotographycourse.com. I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you have safe and happy future travels.